For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Hot air balloons provide breathtaking panoramic views of the surrounding landscape. Passengers get to see the world from a different perspective, with unobstructed vistas that extend for miles in every direction. As the balloon gently lifts off the ground and glides through the sky, there is a profound sense of serenity and peace. The slow, smooth movement allows passengers to feel a sense of tranquility, detached from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. While hot air ballooning can be a thrilling and memorable experience, it's essential to recognize certain risks and dangers associated with this activity. While generally safe, mechanical failures in the burner system or other components can occur, affecting the balloon's flight and safety and can lead to disaster. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. The concept of flying in the air dates back to ancient times, with stories and myths of flight found in various cultures. However, the first recorded instance of a hot air balloon-like device is attributed to the Chinese inventors in the 3rd century AD. They developed sky lanterns or Kong Ming lanterns, small paper bags filled with hot air that could rise when lit. The true pioneers of modern hot air ballooning were Joseph Michel and Jacques Etienne Montgolfier, brothers from France. In 1783, they constructed and launched the first successful hot air balloon in Annonay, France. Their balloon was made of paper and cloth, fueled by burning straw and wool. It rose to an altitude of approximately 6,000 feet, or 1,830 meters, and traveled about 1.2 miles or 2 kilometers before landing safely. This remarkable achievement captured the public imagination and marked the beginning of the age of ballooning. On November 21, 1783, the Montgolfier brothers conducted their first manned flight in a hot air balloon. The balloon carried two passengers. Their successful flight in Paris over five miles or eight kilometers paved the way for human exploration of the skies. After the Montgolfier brothers' breakthrough, hot air ballooning gained popularity and underwent further development. In the early 19th century, advancements in technology led to the development of gas balloons filled with hydrogen or coal gas which offered longer flight durations and better control compared to hot air balloons. In the 20th century, hot air ballooning experienced a resurgence as a recreational activity and a sport. Innovations in materials and burner technology made hot air balloons safer and more accessible to the public. Hot air ballooning became a popular activity for both leisure and tourism, with ballooning festivals and races organized worldwide. Today, hot air ballooning remains a cherished activity offering passengers a unique and serene way to experience the world's beauty from above. It continues to captivate people's imaginations and stands as a testament to the indomitable human spirit of exploration and adventure. For Brian Boland, his hot air balloon flight would be horrific. In 1971, a young Brian Boland found himself in Brooklyn, New York, facing a tight deadline for his master's thesis at the Pratt Institute. Struggling to find an idea, he stumbled upon a Sports Illustrated article about the resurgence of hot air ballooning thanks to introducing a more cost-effective and manageable onboard burner system fueled by bottled propane. This new technology allowed for greater flexibility and control, replacing the traditional use of hydrogen and helium gases. Captivated by the idea, Brian grew up on Long Island with a curious mind and a thirst for new experiences. Ballooning perfectly matched his love for precision and mechanical whimsy. He swiftly drafted a proposal at Pratt and spent the following eight months toiling away in the basement of his shared apartment, where he resided with his wife and son, meticulously designing and sewing a balloon. Presenting it on campus, he referred to it as a sculpture, never ceasing to perceive balloons as unique art forms. According to Kathy Wadsworth, his second wife, Brian, viewed balloons as conceptual works of art, there for a moment, then gone, altering the landscape. Brian returned to this artistic concept repeatedly throughout his life. He served as an art and photography teacher in Farmington, Connecticut. One of his former students, Paul Stumpf, later became a balloonist in Vermont, crediting Brian as a mentor who granted him the freedom to pursue his passions. The allure of ballooning lies in its simplicity. Heated air, less dense than the surrounding air, rises and allows the balloon to ascend in the direction the wind blows. By adjusting the heat, the balloon can be controlled to descend, 
It's a captivating blend of science and art, a graceful dance with the winds that Brian Boland carried with him throughout his life. Boland left his teaching job to devote himself to ballooning. He engaged in various aspects of the ballooning world. Instruction, flying passengers, writing about ballooning, repairs, and most importantly, designing and creating unique balloons. He preferred unconventional events like a contest in Ireland where participants had to land a balloon nearest a pub and return to the starting point with a pint of Guinness without spilling a drop. In 1982, Boland and Wadsworth embarked on an audacious feat, ascending the face of Venezuela's Angel Falls, the tallest waterfall in the world. Despite facing adverse weather conditions, Boland displayed unwavering fearlessness and complete presence during the ascent. In 1988, Boland stumbled upon an airport for sale in Post Mills, Vermont, and saw it as an opportunity to realize his vision of a life dedicated to ballooning. He transformed the 50-acre space into a creative haven, complete with tree houses, motorized furniture, and a workshop home combination made of raw wood and large windows overlooking fields and runways. Balloon apprentices found inspiration and learning opportunities in the loft space called the Thinkatorium. By the late 1980s, Boland's living space had evolved into a treasure trove of eclectic collections, showcasing fire trucks, wicker baskets, vintage vehicles, and various artifacts worldwide. His neighbors affectionately referred to it as Brian's Museum of Rusty Dusty Stuff, where he celebrated the beauty of patina, the signs of age and use that he considered an art form in themselves. Boland's creative spirit resonated widely, as evidenced by the annual Experimental Balloon and Airship Association meet he hosted for fellow home builders, embracing offbeat ballooning. Apprentices revered him as a nonconformist role model who fearlessly pursued his passions and refused to be confined to mundane societal norms. The world knew him not just as a skilled balloonist, but as a visionary whose courage and dedication to his chosen path inspired many to embrace their true creative selves. By 2005, Brian Boland had experienced three divorces. One fortuitous day, he landed his balloon in the yard adjacent to the home of Tina Foster, a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Dartmouth's Geisel School of Medicine. With a whimsical proposal to fly a bathtub up to the roof, Tina joined him, eventually becoming his romantic partner. While Boland was always open to sharing his passion for ballooning with friends and enthusiasts who visited Post Mills, he seldom delved into the depths of his private life, allowing glimpses of it to emerge through his artistic expressions. In 2010, Boland paid a heartfelt tribute to his late son, Jeff, who had tragically passed away at 25. Using scrap wood and inspired by a tiny wire figure Jeff had created, Boland constructed a colossal dinosaur sculpture aptly named Vermontosaurus. A bureaucratic dispute arose when the town classified the sculpture as a structure and demanded a permit, but Boland insisted it was a sculpture, not subject to such regulations. After some resistance, the town eventually permitted the massive tribute to remain. At the age of 71 in 2020, Boland faced health challenges, including heart surgery to repair a faulty valve and an aortic aneurysm following a hernia operation. During his recovery, a kidney tumor was discovered during a CT scan. Despite the hardships, Boland remained determined to return to his life's pursuits. With dreams of completing his transformation of an old bus into a diner and above all, flying again. After a long and arduous journey, the doctors finally gave him the green light. In the spring of 2021, the skies once again became Brian Boland's playground, allowing him to soar with his beloved balloons. Brian Boland's passion for ballooning attracted numerous admirers and aspiring pilots who affectionately referred to his rural residence and airport in Post Mills, Vermont, as the Island of Lost Boys. Under Boland's mentorship, they embarked on a journey to learn the art of ballooning from a master iconoclast. Locally, Boland was renowned as the Balloon Man, a towering figure standing at six foot four, adorned with a beard, wire gray hair concealed under a fisherman's cap, and eyes people believed could perceive the wind's invisible whispers. On the serene evening of July 15th, 2021, Boland exuded ease and tranquility as he prepared for a flight. The conditions were optimal, moderate winds, clear visibility of 10 miles, and the sun's golden rays embracing the landscape. Boland's passengers on this occasion were Emily Blake, her 10-year-old daughter, 
and her parents, Ellen, 67, and Roger, 73. Although locals and familiar with Boland's ballooning reputation, it was their first time flying with him. As the balloon ascended, any initial pre-flight jitters dissipated, replaced by a sense of calm, induced by Boland's evident expertise, nurtured by an impressive 11,000 hours of flying experience. Emily's daughter sought comfort by intertwining her hand with her grandmother's, and together, they marveled at the breathtaking views while soaring over 3,000 feet or 900 meters above the ground. Approximately half an hour into the flight, Boland communicated with their chase driver, Aaron Johnson, to coordinate their direction and course. It was then that Emily noticed a subtle change in Boland's demeanor. He began patting his pockets in apparent search of something. Soon after, the balloon's altitude dropped alarmingly, and Boland's anxiety became palpable as he frantically circled the basket, searching compartments for a solution. Concerned for their safety, Emily inquired about the issue. Boland informed her that the burner's pilot light had gone out and required a striker to reignite it. Despite Emily's willingness to assist, Boland remained unresponsive, preoccupied with his search. Helpless, Emily and her parents watched as the ground rapidly approached, marked by the distinct boundaries of a nearby tasseled cornfield. As the balloon seemed mere moments away from impact, Boland acted swiftly, grabbing a plastic bag with his teeth to access a backup igniter. His skilled hands maneuvered the igniter to the darkened pilot light, eliciting a spark that ignited a flame. Boland then injected more gas into the balloon's vast envelope, its roar signaling a surge of heat and buoyancy. The immediate crisis averted, Boland's expertise again saved the day, steering them away from a potentially catastrophic landing. Yet, little did they know, this was only the beginning of a harrowing and life-altering journey that would test their resilience and determination in unforeseen ways. Boland's urgent command echoed through the air, imploring them to bend their knees for an imminent rebound. However, as they hit the field, the expected bounce didn't materialize. Instead, the impact tipped the basket, causing both Boland and Ellen to be thrown overboard. Meanwhile, the balloon, now pilotless but newly refired and buoyant, lifted off again, ascending with astonishing speed, leaving Emily, her daughter, and her dad Roger on board, bewildered and without any knowledge of how to fly the craft. The true peril they were facing began to sink in as Emily peered over the side of the basket. She spotted a familiar brown loafer wedged into a strap securing one of the propane tanks. Assuming it belonged to Boland and had come off during the chaos, her heart sank at the realization of the danger he had faced. But then, a voice emerged from beneath the basket, a voice that was unmistakably Boland's. Incredulously, Emily looked over the rail again only to discover her initial assumption was incorrect. The loafer was still on Boland's foot. He was hanging precariously below the basket with one foot caught and one hand barely clutching a small handle meant for carrying the basket. His other arm and leg dangled freely over an expansive void. Overwhelmed by the gravity of the situation, Emily recalled the voice of her training as a former EMT, urging her to act. The balloon had a drop line, typically used for ground crew assistance during landings. Could they use it to hoist Boland back into the basket? Could Boland contribute to his own rescue? The answers weren't immediately clear, especially considering they were far from their original cruising altitude, leaving them with limited options. Determined not to leave Boland behind, Emily pleaded with him to get back into the basket, but Boland stubbornly refused, insisting they abandon him. A tense back and forth ensued, with Emily desperately urging Boland to reconsider knowing they needed his expertise to navigate the balloon safely. Then, in a surprising twist, Boland began giving instructions, though the plan remained uncertain. Their predicament seemed increasingly dire with two daunting landing options, an unpredictable water landing or a risky field landing. Emily's daughter could swim, but not proficiently, and the thought of Boland dangling below the basket during a ground landing filled them all with dread. Time seemed to slow as almost an hour passed since their initial takeoff, and the balloon continued its eastward course toward New Hampshire. Far below, life went on in the town of Bradford, completely unaware of the life and death struggle playing out above. In this heart-pounding and surreal experience, Emily, her family, and Boland grappled with an unimaginable challenge, a challenge that held the fate of each life aboard the hot air balloon in a precarious balance. Striving to comply with Boland's instructions, 
Roger followed suit by supplying the balloon with bursts of gas-heated air, then allowing it to float, and finally providing more air as required. Despite the balloon's seemingly straightforward controls, its vulnerability to the wind became evident. In a later newspaper interview, Roger admitted, You can't steer. I had no idea what I was doing. As the daylight began to wane, the valley below was painted with a gentle pink hue. Emily glanced at her father only to see him trembling, mirroring the anxiety she felt, as did her daughter. As the clock neared 7.45 p.m., Bolin's guidance ceased abruptly. Emily's gaze returned to the side of the basket. There she observed Bolin's face contorted with a mix of desperation and exhaustion, now a deep shade of crimson. I can't hold on much longer, he uttered in a faint whisper. After about 10 minutes of flying, Boland was hanging under the basket when he fell silent. The NTSB's preliminary accident report indicated that, at this point, he managed to free his foot and was gripping the balloon with his hands. Emily held onto the drop line between her knees, hoping Boland would accept it if she threw it to him. As they approached the western edge of the river, she heard him exclaim, Oh, shit. Before she could see him fall, she felt the release of Boland's weight from the balloon. He fell face up, his eyes visible, and Emily knew that surviving a fall from that height was impossible. Her father reacted, asking, Oh my God, now what? Her ten-year-old daughter expressed fear and asked if they were going to die. Emily gazed into her daughter's eyes and reassured her, saying, It's very possible, but we're going to do the best we can. You need to trust me. It was a heavy burden to place on a young child, but there was no other choice. Emily grabbed a walkie-talkie and contacted Johnson, the chase vehicle driver and pilot in training. She informed him that her mother and Boland were no longer in the balloon. Johnson, a former U.S. Army Special Forces member, knew he couldn't change what happened. His focus was on preventing a greater catastrophe. He visualized the river and the fields of New Hampshire as Emily described them, and he instructed Roger on maneuvering the balloon. The winds shifted and confused them as they neared the river's eastern shore and drifted westward. Johnson guided Roger on descending to a lower elevation, hoping the winds would reverse and lead them back toward New Hampshire, away from the embankment's trees. Emily worried they might land in water, but an idea struck her when she saw the tree branches below. She pulled the balloon's vent cord, releasing hot air and allowing the branches to act as an anchor, gently guiding them to the ground. Once they landed, they quickly made their way to solid ground and Johnson arrived in the chase van. Calls were made to 911 and Emily's partner. Ellen, who had safely fallen from the basket earlier, mistakenly assumed they had completed the flight. In the van on the way back to Vermont, the rush of adrenaline subsiding, Emily caught sight of Boland lying in a field. He had narrowly missed the water. She remembered his struggle to hold on and then his peaceful acceptance when gravity eventually took over. He hadn't resisted. It was as if he embraced the inevitability of his fall. Following Boland's passing, the NTSB initiated an accident investigation published in August of 2021. The report highlighted an inconsistency in the information Boland provided to federal authorities during the balloon's registration process. Boland had stated that the balloon was manufactured by Cameron Balloons, a prominent balloon company headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan. However, this turned out to be inaccurate. In reality, None of the components were from Cameron Balloons. According to the investigation, the basket and burner were produced by Galaxy Balloons, a smaller manufacturer. The propane tanks were from Worthington, and Boland himself crafted the colorful envelope with rainbow patterns. The type of balloon used fell under the experimental category as classified by the FAA. Generally, such experimental balloons are not authorized for transporting commercial passengers. However, it remains unclear whether the specific type of balloon played a role in the accident. Emily has grappled with numerous what-ifs and scenarios, replaying in her mind how she could have handled things differently. Initially, she was hesitant to be out in public, fearing the lingering questions and insensitive remarks from others. Therapy became a crucial step in processing the traumatic experience, teaching her the importance of opening up and sharing her feelings for healing to occur. During a memorial service held for Boland at Post Mills Airport the previous summer, various speakers took turns expressing their fond memories of witnessing Boland in his balloons, soaring above the mundane realities of life, transcending the ordinary. Boland's unwavering commitment to ballooning as an art form left them in awe. 
Whenever we saw Brian in his balloons, one neighbor recounted, no matter what was happening elsewhere in this country or the world, somehow it felt like all was good. For Bolin, ballooning was a sacred quest, and once he found it, he clung to it with unyielding passion. The enchantment of the experience never diminished for him. Even after years of flying, he would still look up at the balloon and be captivated by it. With all the years that I've been doing this, he told Vermont Public Television in 2014, every now and then I look up inside the balloon and it's empty. There's nothing, except it's full of magic. If you find yourself in a defective hot air balloon or facing an emergency situation during a hot air balloon ride can be horrific. Panic can exacerbate the situation. Take deep breaths and try to remain as calm as possible. Clear thinking is crucial in an emergency and will increase your chances of survival. If the balloon is experiencing turbulence or an unexpected landing, secure any loose items in the basket to prevent them from becoming flying hazards. If the pilot announces an emergency landing, get into the instructed bracing position. This often involves bending your knees and securely holding onto the basket's handles or ropes. Protect your head by tucking it close to your chest during a rough landing. This can help reduce the risk of injury. Hold on tight. Grasp the basket firmly during takeoff and landing to avoid falling overboard. If the balloon lands in an unfamiliar or potentially dangerous area, stay inside the basket until the pilot gives the all clear to exit. Use a phone or radio to communicate with ground personnel or emergency services about your location and situation if possible. Be cautious around the burner and propane tanks to avoid burns or explosions. Wear comfortable and appropriate clothing for the weather conditions. Ballooning typically involves early morning flights when it can be chilly. If flying over water, be aware of flotation devices and emergency procedures for landing in water. Accidents in hot air balloons are rare, but knowing these survival tips can give you the confidence and knowledge to respond appropriately if an unexpected situation arises. Always choose a reputable and licensed hot air balloon operator to ensure a safe and enjoyable experience. Crucial information so you can navigate an outdoor disaster.